Welcome, everybody. I'm Lou Tharp, the executive director and co-founder of the Global Healthy Living Foundation. Thank you for calling in today. This is a young coalition, 340B and me. Where we have members representing employers, think tanks, patient groups, and other interested people because we share one objective in common, to protect 340B for patients who need it and to protect the funds 340B generates so the organizations implementing this program can continue to support their communities. Protecting 340B also involves working with government and participants to take abuse out of the system. This is what our coalition represents. Before we go further, I wanna take a few minutes and talk about what 340B is. For those of you not completely familiar with 340B, it's a program originally intended to deliver drugs to underserved populations. These drugs are sold at steep discounts to clinics, which then bill private insurers, Medicare and Medicaid at retail cost or negotiated cost. The profit or the spread between the purchase price and the reimbursement price is intended to be reinvested in the communities the clinics serve. This tends to work but it has some problems. The problem is that this system is being gamed by contract pharmacies owned by the pharmacy benefit managers and health insurance companies, and sometimes by large hospital systems. Here's how the game works. All or nearly all drugs are bought at steep discounts and then billed to insurers, whether the patient is part of an underserved class or not. But rather than enrich the community that they serve with this additional profit, large hospitals and contract pharmacies are keeping the money. There are honest participants in 340B and we need to protect them, but there are also dishonest ones and they need to be legislatively or judicially eliminated. That's our job. To be successful, the coalition 340B and me needs to implement the proven right combination of data and personal stories. And to do this consistently, we need to continue to speak our message clearly and to the right audience. So to look at data first, I'd like to introduce Robert Popovian. He's our chief science policy officer, and he will review the work we've recently done with the Pioneer Institute on this topic. Robert? Thank you, Lou. And I, before we get started, I want to encourage everyone to put your questions in the Q&A chat and we will get to them at the end of the discussion. We encourage you to ask those questions throughout the presentation and we want this to be more conversational. There's only one segment of my presentation that you will not be able to ask any or we can't be interrupted and that's during the small video that we made that uh, gives a live demo of the website. So without further ado, Ben, why don't we go to the first slide? Okay, great. So the pro project that uh, Lou Tharp mentioned has to do with the work that I'm affiliated with through the Pioneer Institute. So not only I'm the Chief Science Policy Officer at GHLF, I'm also the Visiting Health Policy Fellow at the Pioneer Institute based on Boston. I'm also the Senior Health Policy Fellow at the Progressive Policy Institute, which is based in Washington, D.C. And all three organizations are doing work in this in this area, including GHLF. So the project was spearheaded by my director over there, which is Bill Smith, Dr. Bill Smith, and myself as the secondary researcher. So to start off with, we want to talk about what is 340B. First of all, let's put let's be very transparent. 340B is a great program that has its tentacles for many years into our healthcare system and needs to be revised and preserved, not eliminated. And that's a very important thing that we wanna strengthen it and making sure that it works appropriately and it serves the patients that it's intended to serve. So it's a program that started in the 1990 through the Congress, which basically in a nutshell said, look, we need to have the pharmaceutical, the biopharmaceutical industry sell medicines at a very steep discount to hospitals and other entities that qualify that are serving a lot of uninsured and underinsured patients because they're doing so much charitable care that they can use them this 
the resources from the savings of these medicines to provide care to patients. And, you know, it's a benevolent idea. It's a great idea. And that's why we need to preserve it. So this is how it works. So in reality is that the Medicare patient walks in, the hospital, the, it's a $100,000 drug, list, list drug, they, it buys it for $25,000, and then basically ends up billing uh, the Medicare because they don't get the discount at a steep differentiation and pockets the difference. And then technically, they should be using that savings to be able to provide more charity care. Or the same thing happens in the commercial insurance as well. It's a marginal thing that Lou had mentioned too. Basically, you buy low and you sell high and you keep the margin as profit. And the intention is that you keep this margin as profit, then you should appropriately use it for charity care and the savings through charity. The problem is that it's a policy problem because it's been growing significantly. And the growth really happened after the Affordable Care Act passed because there's two things that happened. Number one, through Affordable Care Act, there was a supposition that any institution can qualify for 340B pricing if they meet a threshold of having a certain percentage of their patients being Medicaid patients. The second thing that happened is that there was a removal of what Lou mentioned is the contract pharmacy issue. So until the Affordable Care Act, there was a cap on number of contract pharmacies that institutions that are covered entities can contract with, that cap was removed. And what we've seen is that there's been an exponential growth in the pharmacy space. And these pharmacies, unlike the 340B uh, covered entities that happen to be hospitals or clinics or any kind of other entities that are non-for-profit and they qualify, for this discount, these pharmacies are for-profit institutions. And we'll show you some data of who these individual organizations are that we're talking to. Lou mentioned in his opening statement, the majority of them are basically for-profit hospital pharmacies that are affiliated with PBMs. And I'll, we'll show you the data to support that supposition. So this is the problem with the whole 340B program. It has reached about 54 billion in 2022. In fact, it increased by 22% from 2021, and it will be, if it's not already, the largest government program regarding pharmaceuticals. It's going to surpass Medicare Part D. And in, inherently, this is the problem, that if the growth has happened, the, the questions are, why is it happening? Who's benefiting from this growth? And are the institutions that are covered entities using the extra benefits as charitable care to provide charity care for patients. And we will show you some data to discuss this. And this is one example. So DISH, which you will hear, it's an acronym, D-S-H, which is referred to as DISH, is Disproportionate Share Hospitals. You see that the revenue growth from 340B has increased. The sales have increased in the DSH hospitals, while the charity care has remained stable or has dipped actually. So it doesn't make sense. If you're collecting more money, then why are you doing less charity work? And that's one of the questions we want to ask, basically, to make sure that the flow of money is going to institutions. Now, not all institutions are doing that, and we'll show you later on in our demo. Some institutions are doing exceptionally well. They are taking in the money from the savings from the 340B, and they're providing a lot of charity care. Other institutions, not so much. And then we will get into the pharmacy, contract pharmacy issue, which is much more convoluted. And that one is dominated by for-profit pharmacies. It's not your local pharmacy that's providing care to an institution that is in a very poor neighborhood, it's primarily for-profit institution. So with that said, I think we wanna to go to the video and do a live demo of the site. And by the way, this is open to anyone and everybody, and you can go in and look at your, the data on your own. And the demo will tell you how to navigate the site. So what we're, we're going to do today is I'm going to demonstrate the website that Pioneer Institute has developed. I'm one of the visiting fellows at the Pioneer Institute, and I've worked on this site. Uh, it has to do with 340B program, and it's called the pioneerinstitute.org forward slash 340B abuse forward slash. So there are three components to the website when you go in it. The demonstrates the 340B program growth, the legislative mapping, and the hospital charity care. So let's start with the 340B program growth. If you click on that, 
you will go to a site that will have, for example, various states. And you can click on the state that you want to pick. I will pick California in this case. And then I want to look at all institutions in California. And then what we see is that, if you notice, when I scroll down, for example, the number one institution in California is Ultimate Health Services Corporation with 316 contract pharmacies, contract, uh, contract pharmacies that they're working with. And if I click on Ultimate, which is the number one, you see that the 294 of those contract pharmacies are within the state of California. And then the remaining is in other states. For example, there's six of them in the state of Texas and so on. If we go up and we click on hospitals only, which are primarily the main recipients of the 340B discount program, University of California and Davis Medical Center is the number one with the most contracts. And if you click on that, you see that out of the 262 pharmacy contracts that they have, 210 are within the state of California, and then the other ones are dispersed all over the country. They have eight contract pharmacies in Florida, seven in Texas, so on and so forth. So the next area of focus on this site is to look at where, where do we look at is the legislative mapping. And the legislative mapping site is a new site that was developed by Pioneer and we launched it a couple of weeks ago. And when you go to the legislative mapping, it has a lot of information. So let's start with looking at lower house map. So lower house map means that it's the representatives. The upper house is the Senate. And let's start with the lower house map. We can click on that. And you see it brings up the state of Alabama because it's alphabetical. But if you scroll down, you can pick the state that you want to look at. So I'm going to pick the state of New York to look at because that's where GHLF is located. So when you click on state of New York, the New York map comes up and you see all the assembly districts. So the grand total and the number of pharmacies in the state of California is 2,121. There are 102 hospitals that provide 340B as covered entities and 358 health centers. Now what you can do is click on a district in the lower house and you see that in district 148, there's three health centers. There's two hospitals and 17 contract pharmacies. And you can do it with any other district that you want to look at. Now, what's interesting is that when you go down here and you look at contracts, so you can do the same thing, by the way, for the Senate. So you can go to the Senate map. It's a different district thing. And again, we'll go to the state of New York. And what you see is that when you click on New York, the Senate districts come on and you could click on a district. So district number 57, there's 10 health centers, there's three hospitals and 31 pharmacies. But the interesting part about this, is that if you go and click on the contracts, right? What you notice is a couple of things. Number one, what you can do is with contract is that you can look at the top pharmacies in the United States that have the most number of contracts with different covered entities. And what you notice is that the top 12, and it shows up in top 12, and even if you go down a little bit, 13 and 14, the top 12 are, the first two are Walmart, but the rest of them are PBM-owned pharmacies. But the interesting part about the contract is that if you go here, you can also scroll down and you can basically look at, for example, in First Avenue Pharmacy in Oregon and so on and so forth. But if you go here with regards to upper house addresses, where it says upper house addresses or lower house addresses, you can go to District 148, which I had picked. You know, you can pick uh, uh, the District 48 and you can see actually who those pharmacies are in each district. So in Assembly District number 48, Tops Market LLC is a pharmacy in Olean with two contracts and so on and so forth. So you can do it both in the upper house and lower house. So that's the legislative mapping. So you can really zoom in and see how many pharmacies, hospitals, and clinics are in each legislative map based on state senate and representative districts. Then the last piece that we've added again recently and we launched two weeks ago is the hospital charity fair. So if you click on that, 
What you go in and you see is that the average charitable contribution of a hospital based on revenue for the last uh, 12 years uh, or 11 years, from 2011 all the way to 2021, and you see that the average is about 2.9%. But what you can do is go look at specifically state overview. If you click on the state, you can pick the state that you want to look at. So let's go back to look at New York. And when you pick New York, what you see is that when you go up, you see the average ratio of charity care is about 2.07. And then you see all the hospitals that are listed here that provide charity care. So for example, Queens Hospital in Center in New York uh, is doing really well. They're providing about 17.5% of their revenue toward charity care compared to the average, which is 2.07. Everybody else is doing it, but then you can scroll down and see that, for example, the United Memorial Medical Center is 1.9. St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Center is 1.4. So this is important because what you could see is that, in fact, if these institutions, what is their level of charity care, but not only the level of charity care, but also whether or not they're equal, lower, higher than the average um, in the state that you're looking at. And we've also put the hospital outliers, state outliers, but I would just focus on the state overview. Pick the state you want to look at and then look at the individual hospital institution that you want to focus on. For example, in this case, Bellevue is a good job. About 12, 11.5% of their revenue goes through charity care, where the average in New York is 2.07. And with that, we're going to end the demo, and let's go back to the presentation again. So a couple of things to keep in mind where we concluded with the presentation. Number one, uh, all of the data that is in this site came from HRSA which is a government entity that collects this information and was downloaded by, except for one thing. The charitable care, care data came from the RAND Corporation. And the reason being, even though the hospitals are required or, or report, they're not really required, but do to report charity care to CMS, um, we did not feel comfortable with that reporting. And RAND Corporation, based in Santa Monica, California, has been following charity care provision by institutions for the last few decades. And we decided to purchase that database from RAND because they normalize everything and put it into this. So I showed you this, that 10 out of 12 pharmacies are PBM owned pharmacies. This is a big business. This is not mom and pop pharmacies locally that are supporting this, these provider, provide entities, basically. So it's important to note that these, these big businesses are operating in the space that is really meant for poor people to get discounts for their medicines. And the last slide is the controversy that has come up. And this is no different than the article that was published last year in JAMA that showed that the pharmacies itself are not located in poor neighborhoods. They did an analysis of looking at different pharmacies geographically, and they found that a lot of these 340B contract pharmacies that are supposed to be in poor neighborhoods or in poor institutions that are providing a lot of charity care are not really located. And we, so we looked at our database, looking at census data with regards to um, poverty levels. And what we found is that some states, actually the pharmacies are okay. They're 50-50. They're in affluent neighborhoods or in poor neighborhoods. But some states are not. In fact, states like Massachusetts, California, Louisiana and New York, there are more pharmacies in affluent zip codes based on district. This is lower house districts and based on poverty level than there are in more uh, poorer neighborhoods that supposedly they should be serving. So in other words, this is something that is very consistent with the research that has been demonstrated in the past that even with the proliferation of these pharmacies, these pharmacies are not located where those patients are living or patients that are supposed to be getting the care and the charity care because of lack of insurance or underinsurance and so on. So with that, I'm going to conclude the presentation, pa pass it back to Lou. And if you guys have any questions, please put it in the chat box. Thank you, Robert. So let me take a minute while we're sifting through questions and talk a bit about what 340B is me is all about and some of the organization around this particular coalition. It is not 
your usual coalition. Uh, we're different. Um, many coalitions ask you to volunteer your time and your organization's resources for free. That's not how we're organized. First, as you can see from the work Robert has done with the Pioneer Institute, we are bringing experts into the coalition. Some of you watching this video, mm -hmm. participating in this Zoom call may be those experts. Others, including employers, community health centers, government relations specialists, congressional and state level uh, government representatives, negotiators, they're all bringing their expertise into the coalition, and that's what we're building now. Your responsibility in the coalition is to bring your expertise or your patient audience or your infrastructure. Your assets are what we want to bring to the coalition to benefit 340B and its preservation. We're ready to pay for these. The coalition has a budget that can properly pay for the services that we're asking all the groups to provide. So it's really important that we understand that this is not a situation where we're asking you to work for free. We don't believe people should be asked to work for free. And we believe that people's uh, expertise is valuable. And we want to make sure that we bring it to this particular endeavor. So again, um, let me give it back to Robert, or let me look at whether um, we've got some questions. Robert, do you want to take the one um, that came in about why we're mapping by Assembly Senate districts? Yeah, sure. Uh, the reason we did this, so we first looked at, Pioneer first last year looked at whether we should do it based on congressional districts. And what happens is that congressional districts are so broad that you can't really locate whether or not pharmacies are really serving poor neighborhoods because a lot of congressional districts have affluent neighborhoods that poor neighborhoods it's very mixed and i specifically looked at nevada nevada has four congressional districts and you know one of the districts has a very affluent neighborhood in las vegas and has a very poor neighborhood so you can't see where the locations of pharmacies are based on congressional districts. so we looked at specifically the senate and the House level on the state level, and specifically the House, uh, the representative level, lower house. And the reason being is that it's much more geographically confined. And based on those representatives, you can see that where those pharmacies are located. And it's a better um, sort of depiction of how, whether or not these pharmacies are serving poor people. Thank you, Robert. Um, let me talk a bit more about the coalition before we go to the next question. Um, we are focused on number one, transparency. We think that in the list of objectives, we have to be somewhat linear and we need to start with transparency first. So this is not an easy lift. Um, we need to understand the what's happening to the funds that are collected from 340B both from contract pharmacy, from large hospitals, from community health centers. And we need to know how much of that money is going back into the community. Now, this will involve um, creating Freedom of Information Act requests. It will involve discussing this with state and federal legislators who may be able to apply some pressure. It, it involves talking to the organizations that actually administer 340B, and it also involves media outreach. I, once we get to there, which may take us several months, we can then pull together the data that will create that compelling narrative that we need in order to more forcefully approach legislators and government folks about why this particular program needs to be changed. Now, we're facing a backlash uh, from suppliers to the 340B program. Um, pharmaceutical companies understand the value of the program, but they also understand that they're selling a lot of drugs that uh, they shouldn't be selling to the markets they're going to. And so we need to follow these cases as they make their way through the courts 
that have been filed by pharmaceutical companies. And that's our second objective. We need to be able to stay on in touch with what's happening in court. We want to preserve this. There are there are participants in this program who have a focus and a dedication to supporting their community. And we need to make sure that above all, that's protected. So following these court cases as they make their way through the, the initial cases and then the appeals is critical so that we can make sure that we have the maximum amount of influence on any outcomes that aren't going to help pre preserve this program. Now, the, the folks that we've spoken with want to preserve 340B. Pharmaceutical companies are not in, in any way excited about walking away from this program. Now, we haven't talked to everybody, but our sense of it is that they just want to find a fair way to move forward. So, Lou, there are a couple of questions that came up that I think it's worth, worth mentioning is that how have the hospitals reacted to this report by the Pioneer? Uh, frankly, the hospitals um, have not, it's, it's, it's been indifferent because mo majority of the report is about the pharmacy expansion, right? The contract pharmacy expansion, especially with regards to pharmacies that are for-profit entities owned by PBMs. And that's more shedding light into this. Now, the hospitals, obviously, when you talk to them, and we've done a lot of discussions between hospitals, and they claim that they're not the ones that are increasing the number of contract pharmacies, that they're being approached by these pharmacies to sign up as providers. But the big question for them is that why are they signing contracts? For example, an institution like University of California in Davis, which is in Northern California, why is it signing a contract with a pharmacy in Maine? Uh, a lot of times you hear from these institutions, well, it's a mail order pharmacy. And my retort to that is that having come from California, I think there's enough mail order pharmacies to, uh, to help them out. So there's something going on here that we need to shed light on. And it has to do mostly with the perforation of these, this program, this government program intended for the poor in the private sector, in the for-profit, especially the PBM loan pharmacies. And that's been the biggest problem in the growth area that I think if we address, it's one of the easiest way to start like putting our arms around fixing the problem without having to gut the entire model, providing discounts to hospitals. Yeah. Lou, one question came for you actually, how much of a time commitment is this for coalition members if, when they join the coalition? So depending on your organization, you can choose uh, how involved you want to be. You can choose the, um, the, the level of remuneration that your organization will receive. Um, and so if you are, uh, if you are a talent that the coalition needs, we may lean on you to give as much of your time as you possibly can. Um, uh, if you have uh, the time to do it, we would love it. Um, but it's ultimately up to you and uh, and how involved you want to get. Yeah. One more one more question for you. They're they're asking, I think you've addressed this. The our patients, individual patients, are they going to be involved in the coalition? Not just so, the organization. You know, for the past several years, 340B has been a hot topic among certain groups, but not patient groups. It's been a hot topic among insurance companies and PBMs and pharmaceutical companies and clinics, um, physicians, private equity groups who see it as a uh, as a cash cow. And it was always considered by patient groups or oftentimes considered as a clash of the titans where the patients really didn't have a voice in what was happening. Well, that's changing now because 340B is starting to affect patients directly. If the drug is not available, then that affects the patient. If there is a, a, a fair amount of tension getting that drug, getting that particular uh, treatment protocol in place, that affects the patient. We also believe that there could be some structural reform that could benefit the patient even more. And it has to do with giving the patient more power in this equation. And we have a program that we'll be announcing in a few weeks 
that will will create that will move the power vector over to the patient as opposed to the the uh, hospital or the contract pharmacy and this will be counter to what generally is happening in healthcare today where the patient is having less and less say in their treatment along with their physician who's having less and less say and we need to be able to counter that in this program specifically so yes patients are critical. Patients are critical from a data standpoint, as well as a personal story standpoint. Without the patient, 340B does not have a face. So the one of the questions that came also has to do with charitable care. Why do hospitals, and I can answer this, why do hospitals provide charitable care? Frankly, hospitals have been providing charitable care for a very long time. In fact, if you look at an institution like the one I trained in LA County, USC, uh, before the passage of the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion in the state of California, they were providing about 60% of their revenue was going towards charitable care comparatively, like percentage of revenue going towards charitable care. What you saw is that a significant dip happened after Medicaid expansion in all institutions. And in fact, uh, that dip happened in specifically in states that passed Medicaid expansion. So the charitable care de decreased. And in fact, when you go back and look at the database, you will see that states that have not expanded Medicaid, their institutions in those states are actually providing the most charitable care, which is inherently makes sense. The problem has been that as the program has grown, the charitable care after that initial dip from ACA has dipped even further, which doesn't make sense. And that's the question that people are asking. So. One of the policy solutions that has been provided is perhaps on the charitable care side, should there be a threshold? So if you're a 340B provider and institution, whether you're a clinic or a hospital, you're getting 340B discounts, should a specific percentage of your revenue go towards charity care? And as I mentioned, some hospitals are doing exceptionally well. They're doing the right thing. They're raking in the money and the savings and they're providing charitable care. Others are not. And very prominent ones are not. So that's one of the things about charitable care. The other thing that has to happen is what should there be a level of charitable care for these for-profit pharmacies that are involved in this program? That doesn't exist either. You know, as I mentioned, as I showed you, top 12 pharmacies, two, number one and two is Walmart, and the next 10 are PBMO pharmacies. Should they, they be mandated if they want to participate in the 340B program to provide certain percentage of their revenue gained from it for charitable care? That doesn't exist. So it's more about trying to do and making sure that we have more transparency, as Lou mentioned, but then also that these institutions that are taking the savings are providing adequate charitable care and that their charitable care is not diminishing. In fact, if you go back and look at one of the slides I showed you about the dish hospitals and the level of decrease in charitable care, if you look at dish hospitals versus private hospitals, their level of charity care is identical. It's about 2.6% and 2.5%. That doesn't make sense. Private hospitals are not getting these huge discounts for 340B, while the those other institutions are, and therefore they're providing as much charity care as the other institutions, the dish hospitals that are getting these discounts. So again, transparency, what Lou said, and level and have some level of setting of charity care is important. I think I could take the next question. Sure. Um, how should patients talk about this to their providers? And this is a conversation that I would bet has never come up with a provider. Um, the patient has been completely unaware of the 340B program. The patient doesn't get a large bill, but they don't necessarily understand why they don't have a large copay or uh, uh, any sort of deductible to meet. So talking to a provider about this is, is a very interesting adventure on the part of the patient because until the patients see that they're not getting the level of care that they were getting in the past, they may not have an interest in talking about this specifically to providers. So. I'm not sure where we'll go with that yet. We've got a subcommittee that we have uh, put on paper anyway in the org chart that specifically talks about how we work with providers because providers oftentimes don't have anything to say about this either. 
their clinics, their hospitals, the contract pharmacy that the patient insurance or Medicare or Medicaid uh, engages with is making the decision. So the patient's primary responsibility early on will be talking to other key opinion leaders like legislators, um, like government officials, local, state, and uh, um, um, regional elected officials. Um, that's where we think the patient voice can be most powerful early on. And we think that the patient and the provider can speak in parallel rather than to each other. So they take their voice to the elected representatives at the state and the federal level. And so while they're both talking about preserving 340B, they're speaking at it from different perspectives to a third party rather than to each other. So two, two last questions that are related to me is that what other entities besides patients and providers do you think the coalition should consider having employers? Employers without a doubt. Uh, there's there's already an awareness among employers that they're overpaying for some of these medicines. You know, the pharmacies and the institutions are buying it very low and then billing private insurance at very high levels. They believe that this is affecting their premiums and they're right because of the differentiation in the bill. So employers have uh, really need to be involved in it and they've demonstrated their willingness to learn more about it. In fact, the work in Pioneer, a lot of employer coalitions had approached us for the results. And the second question is, what does a model bill look like that passes that helps out? I think there's a few things you can do. One is what I mentioned about charitable care. Can you put a threshold? That means if you're participating in a 340B program, whether you're a pharmacy, for-profit pharmacy or institution, a covered entity, you have to provide a certain percentage of your revenue gain from the 340B towards charity care. There should be like a level, you know, and if you want to do more, great. If you want to do less, that's fine. But it can't be below, for example, a certain level, whether it's 10, 15 percent, whatever percentage that come, comes up. The second thing you can do, and this is the question I had when reporters call me about 340B and they say, well, what should I ask 340B provider, these covered entities is number one, ask them why, do I, why do they need so many contract pharmacies? Why does the University of California in Davis has over 260 contract pharmacies? And why are those contract pharmacies located all over the map, including in states that are thousands of miles away? Uh, these, this program is not meant for affluent patients. These patients are not going to be able to travel. I, I understand if you live in New York City or New York State and you have contract pharmacies in Connecticut and New Jersey because of the geography. You know, but that maybe they live close enough to a pharmacy in that other state. Therefore, you need to have a contract pharmacy close enough. It just doesn't make sense why a, a university system that is benefiting from 340B in Northern California needs to have a contract pharmacy in Maine or in Puerto Rico or in Hawaii. If it's mail order, as I mentioned before, I'm 100% certain that there are enough mail order pharmacies to meet their demand. So those are the two fixes that you can do legislatively. It is mandate that these contract pharmacies located in the geography that are serving the patients that they are supposed to be serving, not thousands of miles away, not in other states and so on. And the second thing is the charitable contribution threshold that they should provide. I think I can take the next question, um, an example of a model of model legislation that will uh, be able to put 340B on more solid footing and avoid abuse. And I think if we look at programs that are successful, both private and government programs, the most the common success metric among those programs is that the power belongs to the person who is the ultimate consumer of the program. If we look at many government programs, they rely with the they the, sorry they rely on the individual to qualify. They rely on individual um, uh, again metrics to determine qualification. And we don't have enough time today to talk in depth about what we're going to be proposing. But in the next few weeks, we will go public with a program that moves that power to the patient and moves it away from 
the entities that are now controlling it. And I think that was our last question, Lou. Or... I think it is. If there's anything else, uh, this is your last chance. Um, all right. So let me do a wrap up. And in the meantime, if another question comes in, I'll uh, I'll stop and we will, uh, uh, you know, we'll take time to answer that. So I want to thank everybody for attending. And if you're watching this as a, as a video wrap up, uh, know that you can communicate with us uh, either chat online now or through email. Uh, my email specifically, ltharp at ghlf.org. Um, or Robert Popovian, which is R Popovian, P O P O V I A N at ghlf.org. And you can ask us questions both about 340B, about the coalition. 340B is me. Um, grassroots reform is the mission of this organization. Uh, that's why we're talking to you. We are interested in, in creating a forceful and a large coalition that has a large microphone. And we believe that the combination of employers, um, physicians, community clinics, hospitals, uh, everybody who is doing, um, who is implementing 340B the right way needs to be in this coalition. If you're representing patients, whether it's 100 patients with a rare disease or hundreds of thousands of patients uh, with chronic conditions, think about enlisting in this coalition. Think about what you can do, how it can uh, generate revenue for your organization and do good in the world. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, we will uh, end this. Robert, anything from your side? No, I think you covered it well, Lou. We look forward to hearing from everyone who's interested in getting involved because this is a worthwhile program to maintain and fix and put on solid footing, like you said. Very good. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, you'll get a notice of the next webinar and uh, future announcements. <laughs>